and today we start our scientific session with Ray Shilito. He gained his degree in biochemistry and uh, also has a PhD in biochemistry with a focus on plant tissue culture and in England. Um, before he was moving to his, he, before moving to the USA, he did innovative research in plant genetic transformation in the Netherlands and in Switzerland. So he's been to Europe before. Mm -hmm. um, as a BA, BASF senior expert, he represents BASF, um, the seed and trades um, part of the company, in many trade associations and technical and science organizations, including CropLife, ISO, AOAC, ISTA, and AEIC, and the Cereals and Grains Association, where he is a board member. So he contributed to the Codex Guidelines on the decisions on DNA and proteins, chairs the ESO committee, the Technical Committee 34SC16 on biomarkers, and he contributed to ISO Smart Farming Initiative and chairs an IEC working group. So he's really active in this um, standardization, normalization, and um, trials. So um, welcome, Ray. Um, we're hoping um, to get interesting information uh, about analytical methods for the detection on NGT products. Thank okay, you. thank you very much. And thank you everybody for hearing and thank you to the organizers and all the organizing uh, organizations. I put on here a couple of disclaimers because that's what we do. Uh, I work for BSF, I'm actually retiring in two weeks so I can basically say what I like, I guess. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, as I say, I've, I've been around a long time and I'm involved in a lot of organizations. And I've been thinking about this topic for about six years. Uh, it's occurred to me back in 2016 this could be an issue. And so we've been looking at this for a while. I want to thank uh, the co-authors of this from BSF on the left here and also the people on the right who have contributed to the publications I'm going to talk about. And Margit and Sonia are both here. And Annalise is here in the audience as well. Uh, so thank you to those guys. The first thing I want to say is we do, we have published uh, a couple of articles in this. One is the one we published in in vitro plant uh, in 21, 2021. And we really focused there on going from the plant to the seed. And then on the right hand side, you see a book that we, that I edited and came out last year. There's a QR code there for those who want QR codes. It's easy to find. And this covers a whole of applications, detection methods from proteins to you name it. And there's a chapter in there on detection of genome edited plants. Now I'm saying genome edited because that's my preferred version. People say gene edited, but you can also edit other parts of the genome than just the gene. So I say genome edited. And those are the ones I'm going to focus on. I'm not going to go into the NGT whole field. I'm really going to focus on those where we do not edit. Right? My talk is in three parts. I'm going to quickly talk about the impact. And Emilio covered a lot of this yesterday, thank you. So I don't have to give you the whole background. Uh, proposed detection methods, and there's a lot of discussion around that and how effective. And I'm really going to focus on the common questions I keep being asked about how can I detect or not detect, and, and those issues. Just to give you some context, genome editing is just another milestone in plant breeding. And you see circled there at the end, actually, our second speaker is going to talk about waxy mates. So it's very appropriate uh, that we have that. It works out pretty well. It's just another tool that we're using in plant breeding. I did like this. I saw this. So, uh, <laughs> Petra asked the question of, uh, of chat GPT about genome editing. And so I, and she posted it on LinkedIn. Thank you very much. I don't know where she is. Um, and I said, I did ask her yesterday I could use it or not. Um, I thought this was really cool. And the piece I like is to help farmers feed the world with pride and put food on tables worldwide, which is very appropriate given the climate crisis and things we're doing. So I thought this was a, a really nice thing, a quote. I'm not going to talk just about CRISPR. CRISPR is not the only gene editing tool, so don't get focused on that. I used to have a talk that was called, Is It CRISPR? And it wasn't talking about Kentucky Fried Chicken. Uh, it was talking about gene editing. However, the SAGE database, which was mentioned yesterday, shows that there are more than 50 countries, and this is just the top 10, and there are, what, 60 crops 
And I think more than 400, I think, applications were mentioned. So it, this is a lot of it out there. And if you look at this, there's a nice publication by Jenkins in the same one as the one we did in 21, in the same volume. And they talk about how genome edited crops can contribute to UN sustainability goals, sustainability goals. And I, I wrote those a little bigger so they're easier to see. You can see this is just a selection of some of the crops and some of the possible contributions to sustainability goals that they could provide. And I am hoping to, that BSF will allow me to publish the slides, so that's my goal. So, say, so where do we need detection methods? As I said earlier, we do need them when we're developing a new edit. We want to make sure we've got the right one, because if we haven't got the right one, we've got a problem. And so we're doing selection and we're doing that. So that was the, the, the subject of our first publication. And then if you go to the end of the chain, when you start moving things around the world, and we have all these different regulatory systems, we're going to need these in international trade. And that's really more the topic I'm going to cover. And that's more what's covered in the book chapter. The question is, once an edit is made, how do we detect it? And so if we take SDN3s, I'm going to just say, put that on the side. That's not an issue. There we have a big chunk of DNA we put in. It's basically classical GMO methods. It's not a problem. When it's a single base or a few base pairs, and you might want to look back at the publication from Lutz Groman on the size of an insert that may be distinguishable. It's not technically straightforward. You may say, well, it is. However, we don't have enough instances where we know that we can do this. And there are multiple ways of looking at changes in the DNA, either from looking, you know, is it, is it herbicide resistance, if it's this or that. I'm going to focus on two methods, which are both DNA-based, and really what we're talking about at this conference. PCR detection and sequencing. And there's been a lot of discussion around this, and one of the big issues that we have is for bulk samples and food, and someone mentioned, questioned about food yesterday. For food and bulk samples where you've got you know, shiploads of stuff. We may be pushing the limits of detection to the limit. And in these cases, we may get ambiguous results. You say, well, why is that important? Well, it's under contracts. There may be legal issues. For regulatory authorities, this is a nightmare. Because you don't have clear results all the time. You may have in some cases. And that's where validation and all these other things come into it. And as you know, PCR depends on DNA recognition. I'm not going to go through that. The question is, what does a single base pair look like if you're trying to do a PCR with a, fiber, with a, a, a primer mismatch at the end of the primer? What's it look like? So this is a case I drew up, the fictional, totally fictional. And you see here we've, done, we've changed arginine to leucine in this protein. And so we've got a difference, right? So what we've done is, if you look at, oh, sorry, I'm going to go back. If you look at this, so once you get extension of that first primer uh, cycle, everything looks the same. So the only chance you have to differentiate in the PCR is the first cycle. Now, there is a poster downstairs, I noticed, where you have different uh, labels on the different primers, and that may be useful. However, as I was talking to somebody earlier, I looked in the literature for thermodynamics of mismatch. There are two papers, and they're old. And so we don't know very much about this. This is a CT change here. The difference in the PCR reaction for a CT change is about 100-fold, maybe a bit more, 200. But for some of the other changes, the difference is very much smaller. It may be only 10-fold. And so you'll get a lot of mispriming, and then you, you can't distinguish. So those are the challenges that we're facing. You can th use things like um, LNA bases, PNA base, uh, techniques, protein nucleic acids. You can use these to help differentiate and block amplification of one of these two options, either the, the wild type or the, the one you're looking for. So these are some of the options you can use in, P in PCR and have been used and shown to work to some extent. 
Again, it only applies to the initial PCR amplification. After that, you've got something that looks the same. So then you, you've got a differentiation problem. And I personally have not done any of these experiments. This is just from looking what's out there and talking to people. So if we look at PCR and we can summarize it, uh, PCR is low cost, easy to use, everybody does it. Everybody that has a PCR machine does it. And one of the things I learned from going around the world doing workshops on this is not everybody has a PCR machine. Or not everybody can afford a PCR machine. And a lot of small island nations may not have access to PCR machine and definitely not to digital PCR. So it's one of the questions you should ask for a rich area like the European Union, you have no problem accessing their methods. But I remember back going to a codex meeting where, when the acrylamide problem with milk is, and someone said they had an MS, on an LCMSMS method and it worked every time. But the person from a country that didn't have it, that in their country said, well, I don't have one of those. What are you going to do for me? Think about that. It's important. Uh, detecting large edits, as I said, is not a problem. And we may be able to use the PCR, <coughs> excuse me, to detect small edits. And um, <coughs> they may be difficult to detect in, in bulk samples. And we can use modified probes. However, each case is different because <coughs> each edit will be in its own environment in case of the, the bases around it. And so it may not be that easy. Sorry. I talked too much at the mixer last night. Um, I wore my voice out. So. OK, so let's look at the next thing, which is sequencing. And so sequencing can be a very strong tool for this, because you're looking for a base pair change. And in theory, it shouldn't be a problem. And you could use targeted deep sequencing, for instance. And now sequencing is getting more and more accurate. And so it's going to help. And the question that keeps being asked, and I'll come back to it, can you use sequencing to find unknown edits? And the answer is no. If you've ever looked at five, you know, looked at five or six plant genomes, they're all different, even from the same field. There's a lot of variation. So you can't tell if something an edit or just a natural variation. And I say it's not useful for testing bulk samples. I would say that it may be, depending on the edit. The big issue in sequencing so far, and I think this is improving, is signal to noise ratio. And so this, I don't know if you can tell who this person is or you've seen this picture before. Um, there, are, there are issues around, you know, what's the LOD for this? What's the limit of detection of sequencing? And so if you have less noise in your picture, you can see Charles Darwin is showing up here. And the sequencing methods we have are getting better all the time. And we may be able to you know, to use it. And from what I can hear, we're going to have some presentations today that actually show that it can be used. There are developing technologies. Obviously, isothermal is an interesting area because you can do that on site. You don't have to have a complicated laboratory. Um, CRISPR to detect CRISPR. There was a lot of hype about Sherlock and all this. However, it's just another method. It's just another isothermal method. And some of these isothermal methods, when you drill down, the recognition is actually dependent on the, on the concentration of what you're targeting. And for some of these uh, approaches, you have to have a minimum concentration, so then you have a problem. That's target concentration dependent. So there's a lot of interesting things there. And you know you can drill down. I, I constantly am collecting more and more publications, and it's 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 a lot out there on this. What I really want to fo focus on is the common questions, and these are them. These are the. What about off targets? Can I distinguish from a natural mutation? Can I detect a gene edited grain in shipment or, or, a, or in food? How feasible is it to deploy these? Infrastructure was mentioned a couple of times yesterday. It's not simple. And can we do screening? And that relates back to infrastructure problem. First one, off-target editing. It is of low concern in plants. In fact, there's a poster downstairs on looking for off-target edits. 
and they didn't find any, which was very interesting. We do have, for major crop plants, we have very good genomes, so we can, we can really test uh, in, vitro, in vitro, we might say, you can look and see if there's a possibility of off-target edits. And then plants are extremely resilient. There's, their genomes are so resilient, you can knock pieces out and they just carry on. They're very plastic. And then, and it came up yesterday, in most cases, commercial varieties are backcrossed. And even if we have elite material, and I remember from event 176, for those who remember that one, that was done in elite germplasm and backcrossed, even though it was already in elite germplasm. And so off types, if there are any off types, we get rid of them. If there are any edits somewhere in the genome, they'll disappear. It's not a problem in plants, not a concern. The other question is, uh, what's the natural background rate? And the background rate in, in corn is horrendous. I mean, there's transposons and all sorts of things going on. The main point about that, and if at the top right, if you've seen this picture, these are all uh, induced mutants, uh, radiation-induced mutants, if you look at that picture, and some very familiar crops there. The main point is that DNA sequence will be the same whether you made that mutation intentionally or you picked it out of a population. And that was something else that came out yesterday. So the safety profile of these will be the same. So the question is, why would they be regulated differently? Good question, huh? The point is that detection methods cannot discriminate intentional from background mutations. And there has been discussion of the paper somewhere. They said all oh, these map sequences that the CRISPR is used to, you know, the, the, to find the, the edit area. There are 90-something different CRISPR enzymes discovered so far. That was already some time ago, so it's probably gone up. And all of them are different in some way. So there are no sequences that are common to edits. There's no screening. So you can't differentiate spontaneous and directed mutations, which comes back to what it was discussed already yesterday. And in fact, I quoted here from the Network of Laboratories uh, report you saw yesterday. There's also a, a publication, I think I saw it on Friday from Voigt, from the University of Passau, basically saying the same thing again. What about grain in shipments? So I have 50,000 tons of soybeans, and I'm going to sample it. Yeah, what about that? And so at the moment, yes, you take 3,000 soybeans and you test it. And if you really want to do a lot, you do 10,000 or 30,000. And I once invited somebody to test for one in a million, but they didn't want to grind up 300 kilos of soybeans, which is what it would take. So you've got a problem there. The technical limitations, though, is, is a limited sensitivity. And for some edits, you may be able to get a good limited detection. You may be able to get down there, and I think we're going to hear about that. However, for others, we may not be able to meet those performance criteria that are required in Europe. And we don't know, because we haven't seen every edit. It'll be interesting. The most important thing from a technical point of view and an and a infrastructure or applications point of view is there is no common DNA element. Every single edit is different. Every single one requires a fully validated method. And you see, what was a 400 and something edits? I think you said yesterday, Emilio. Um, and detection doesn't mean identification, because it may be that different people have produced the same mutation several different places, uh, several different companies, for instance, and marketed it. And there may be natural mutations out there, which we'll also hear about. This is going to be an enforcement issue for regulators. Implementation. There are already challenges in implementing GMO detection in those areas that don't have millions of euros to spend on it. And again, when I've been around the world looking at places, they may not have a PCR machine even. So how are they going to implement this kind of detection? And costs are increasing already because of the multiple events regular GMO events are out there. And we already have a, cri a crisis in that area in some, some areas of the world, and not just the small island nations. 
I did a, I did a talk for ASEAN a year and a half ago or so, virtually, and that was one of the issues we discussed. No screening methods, so every case by case, I said that already. I think yesterday the, the issue is, is there a source of information on methods? And expertise may have been short supply. And if you say, well, there'll be methods in the European database, well, guess what? We've already got GMOs in the US that are not registered in Europe because they're not traded. However, what happens if they get into the, the commodity supply or something like that? Or if it's tomatoes and somebody uses it to make a soup? We had issues many years ago about cauliflower, uh, which is used to thicken soups. And cauliflower has 35S in it because of cauliflower mosaic virus, and they were getting hits all over the place until people realized that was an issue, right? <laughs> um, so expertise is really critical. The conclusions I have is there are many types of detection tools. There are also many, several different editors. Most applications we talk about today employ PCR steps. You cannot differentiate from mutations. Even small in, uh, inserts and deletions. You know, I think Lutz's paper is maybe 11. He said, you can't really say, well, did that happen you know, by accident or did it happen uh, a result of radiation or mutation or was it something you edited? And so how will you actually do that? And you know, you can, you can scrape the literature and the, and the patent databases to find that, but you still can't prove that that's the chain. There are capacity chain challenges to implementation especially in less wealthy countries. And I think that's something we have to talk about when we talk about international standards. And I go back to that codex example. What we do internationally needs to be applicable internationally. Otherwise, we, dis we disrupt trade. Detection tools will continue to evolve, and we've seen in the, in the sequencing area, we've seen an evolution, a, a decrease in error rates and things, and there are some very good tools now. The question is, will that be enough? And will that be available? And if I can not drop the pointer, uh, that's, again, thank you for inviting me. Uh, this is the official BSF last slide. Uh, <laughs> for those of BSF, no. Um, thank you very much. And uh, I will, I guess I've got time to entertain questions. A couple of technical questions. Thank you.